For quite the long while, I've turned my beak up at the use of proxies for card games. Not because of the rights or wrongs of doing it in the first place. No, it's more that printing a card on plain paper, shoving it in front of a real card of the game you're proxying, and sleeving it up seemed like an unforgivable slight to the card gaming gods. Well, as time has passed, and as fate would have it, I, Benjai, have changed my tune. Because today we bring you the guide to making the ultimate proxies. Whether you want to supplement your existing collection for a game that's out of print, create cards for your own game, or as we'll be highlighting in this here video, making the best looking reproduction of a print and play game, then this is the guide for you. I think you'll be amazed at the sort of results you can get using only basic home office equipment. And so please, join me on this most enlightening of journeys. Day zero then, and like any project worthy of its name, we would leave no stone unturned to create the holy grail of surrogate cards. One thing we did know at the outset is that we couldn't cost effectively replicate the manufacturing process of the real thing. You see, most collectible, live-in, deck construction card games use a similar printing process, whereby an opaque adhesive core is sandwich pressed between a front and back layer of cardstock that's coated with a silk type finish that looks and feels like a hybrid of matte and gloss. So with that path out of the question, we had to work with what we can reasonably afford. That being paper and cardstock that's readily available from any reputable stationery supplier. A home and office inkjet printer, and a few odds and sods. None of which would break the bank. But first we needed to identify a comparable weight of cardstock. And this is where we meet Timmy's Magic the Gathering card. The template that was subsequently used by pretty much anybody that made a deck construction game ever since Magic hit our tables in the mid 90s. But let's back up a sec, because for the eagle brain of you you'll be thinking well surely it's thickness not weight that should be the primary determining factor to replicate Timmy's card. And while yes you may be right, the print industry isn't interested whatsoever in what we want, as most all paper is labelled by weight. And so, reliably determining the thickness of the card we buy to get to the desired 0.305mm or 0.012 inches is a straight up fool's errand. As you can imagine then with the threat of forgery and fakery, the precise details of the paper used by publishers forces us to take a trip to Best Guest Town. Yes, there have been tidbits of official, unofficial and leaked information released over the years, but a general consensus on what's what is still an estimate. But said consensus is that most card games will simulate the comparable look and feel of between 300 and 350 grams per square metre, aka GSM, or 80 and 93 pounds, with somewhere in the middle being the likely sweet spot. Which brings us to another obstacle, that not all paper is created equal. Some stock might be thicker but lighter and vice versa. One more reason why chasing the right thickness was not the path laid out for us. So with the ability to press three pieces of card together all professional like out of the question, could we get to where we need to be just finding a suitable stock paper with an appropriate finish and printing our images and saying hey presto. Well this is where we went full trial and error in our compulsive pursuit to make the perfect proxy. And so we got our greasy mitts on some regular cardstock, some super smooth, as well as some double sided matte and double sided glossy photo paper. Oh, and just for gits and shiggles, we obtained some linen paper to see how well that would turn out. Because, well, if it works for regular playing cards and the bulk of cards in ball games, then why wouldn't it do the trick for this holy pursuit? So the regular card stock was up first, and with both fingers crossed for a winner, as we know we could readily obtain this type of paper all the way up to 350 GSM, 93 pounds, or even higher if it was needed. But as you can see though, the end product was just not up to making the most of the image, and the difference between the regular and super smooth card stock was barely visible. So that was much ado about nut ink. It just wasn't possible no matter how much we tweaked the printer settings to get it to a level of quality that was close to acceptable. 
We then tried photo paper, which we knew would fare much better in the quality stakes. And as expected, this was what we were hoping for in terms of fidelity of both the card image and the all important card text. I'd hoped the matte photo paper would be the winner just so we didn't get all that reflective nonsense. But although they do produce an excellent visual representation of the card art, the glossy photo paper ultimately did a better job with some of the colour palette and did so with slightly clearer card text as well. Still, the matte photo paper could be perfectly adequate for some. The problem we had at this point, even though we were happy with the photo paper, was that double sided or even single sided photo paper is only readily available or at least affordable up to 300 GSM or £80. And no matter how much I wanted to be satisfied with the way both the gloss and the matte felt in your hand to flex and shuffle, they were an icky bit too flimsy and the glossy finish way too sticky to shuffle properly. Now for some a good card sleeve will come to the rescue of even the most disappointing outcome and you could absolutely grab your thick photo paper, put it in a sleeve and be 70% of the way to a winning proxy. You don't have to worry about the back of the card, everything is pliable and clear and you could call it a job jobbed. Well, I'm sorry ladies and gentlemen, that just would not do for me. I wanted the card to look and feel a lot more similar to the real McCoy than this when unsleeved. And so this is where we needed to find a way to artificially add some thickness and weight to the finished product. And so we called up an old friend, Mr. Laminating Machine, and asked very kindly for him to do his thing for us. You see, the idea was not only will laminating pouches give us a splash of much needed heft, they'll also give us more control over the finish of the card, provide some added durability and hopefully do a better job of mimicking the bend, flex and shuffle of the real thing. But as much of a great idea as laminating seemed, the sheets and pouches you can buy are generally classified in microns or mils, which is both a thousandth of a millimetre and inch respectively. And for those of you that are clever like me, you'll realise that that's a measure of length and not a measure of mass, which we've been using as a unit of measurement this whole bloody time. So just to make things awkward, we needed to normalise the thickness of the laminate into a roughly equivalent GSM or poundage. Well, thankfully good old Benji did the mega complex math for you, and so with a small margin of error, we determined that our 150 micron, which is roughly equivalent to a 3 mil laminating pouch, and which is the standard, has a comparable GSM of 140, or 37 pounds. Uh, it was at this point that doubt in our mission crept in. The rabbit hole had been dug, I was neck deep in numbers and paper, but as a responsible content creator, I had to forge ahead. We knew we wanted to get to that sweet spot of an approximate 325 GSM, 86 pounds, so we narrowed the choices down to double-sided glossy photo paper between 180 and 220 GSM, or 47 and 59 pounds, which we reasoned that with the laminate on both sides would bring us to Proxy El Dorado. Now, when conducting this test, you're not really feeling the difference in thickness, especially with just the one card in your hand. It's more about the flex and the bend of the cards that you're using to determine likeness. And so, conversely, the 220 GSM paper we had was ever so slightly restrictive in its flexibility, which left us with the 180 and that sweet feeling of gratification. This was it. The mythical proxy to beat all proxies. And I had discovered it. What a privilege to be part of history. So we'd found our materials, but how do we get from A4 sheets of print and play PDFs like the wonderful folks over at Nisei provide for their fan collective Android Netrunner sets to a deck of cards? Well, the recommended way in that example is as simple as printing the pages off, grabbing your nearest guillotine or cutting machine and having at it. Popping them in a sleeve and then rocking up to your mate's house or a friendly local and getting your game on. Our quest demanded that step further. 
glorious card-based rectangles that could hold their own against the mighty originals. We wanted a double-sided finish and the cherries on top. But before we go onward, bound a word on the finish of the laminating sheets. You can get them in either glass or matte. And if you're going to sleeve these cards, then you can afford to use glass because they do provide a marginally clearer image through the laminate. And it'll be the finish you have on the sleeves that will be the determining factor for whether it's reflective to the light. But because we wanted the best looking card outside of a sleeve, we opted for matte laminating pouches. Knowing that we could still change our minds and sleeve them at a later date and it would make very little difference to the end product. I suppose the best way to guide you in this whole methodology is to use gloss for everything up until the outermost layer of what you're producing. So if I knew I was just going to sleeve these cards, they'd be gloss laminated and then matte sleeved. Simple as. Unless of course you give not one jot about light bouncing off your cards, then ignore everything I just said and be on your way. For our next step, we needed our own template because A, it would allow us to use this process for other games we wanted to play and B, well, that will become apparent in a hot minute. Now, I used Photoshop to set up an A4 page at 300 ppi, which is the default for print media and spaced out nine mock cards at the dimensions popping up on screen right now. And so that there were gaps between each. Now, yes, you could abut each image to make the cutting process easier, but the main reason we didn't is because we wanted artwork on the card backs as well. Here, for these ANR cards, we used a design by a member of the community that's been made available free to use. But the method we use manually feeding the paper in a printer to print on both sides never perfectly aligns, no matter how careful you are. So our way around that was simple in its elegance. Just make the card backs marginally bigger to factor in the slippy slidey of the poxy printer. Even with duplex printing, there's no guarantee this won't be an issue. And the beauty of this approach is that most card backs won't look much different with the very edge of their borders cut off. So everyone's a winner. Now we opted to increase the width by 20 pixels and the height by 10, knowing that the offset was most often found on the left or right. And once that was sussed, it was as simple as printing one side and then the other. Smushing the paper under hair of your book until the ink completely dries, and then sleeving it up in its laminating pouch ready to go. Now, one piece of advice with laminating machines. One is make sure you set it on the highest heat setting. The obvious reason being the hotter it is, the more it binds the materials. And secondly, always wait a few more minutes after the machine says it's ready, just to make sure you're at the optimal temperature. A quick feed through once and then twice flipped over in reverse should do the trick. But make sure the second it's done, you take that heavy pile of books you've got on standby and plonk them on top. Ensuring your new cards cool down as straight as you're going to get it. Yes, this is very much the lo-fi way of ensuring that warping is not a factor. But if you're methodical and take the advice that's been given, you should be fine. Because for anyone that owns foil cards, you'll know that warped card is enough to make a human cry tears of water. So please do heed this warning, lest ye be purveyors of regret. All that was left then was to round those corners, baby, and you're basically done. You'll find that the most common rounded edge is approximately three millimeters, so pick yourself up a corner puncher and get punching. It's those finishing touches that are always the most gratifying, and here is no exception. Just look at the subtle off-circle corners, the tasteful thickness of it. Oh my god, even as a laminate. Yeah, boy, look at that. The perfect, in my highly biased opinion, proxy. A wonder to behold for sure, and a highly successful outcome, even if I do say so myself. Wow, what a journey it's been. I've been working on this on and off for a while and I actually believe the end result has at the very least met my fairly lofty hopes and expectations. I know that this didn't necessarily qualify as a detailed step-by-step -step process. If there's a want or a need for it, I suspect I'd be more than happy to oblige. I do very much hope you found this useful. Is there anything you think I didn't consider or could have done better? 
please let me know in the comments. Alas, I have been the voice in your head, and this video has ended.